All right, hey y'all, it's Miss Summers. Uh, today we are going to change our pace a little bit and we are going to spend today looking at review of all the material that we've gone over thus far. This will benefit you uh, if you haven't been here. It will also benefit everybody since we missed such an extended period of time with the snow days. So what you need to do over the course of these notes is listen to this video. You may pause it anytime you feel like you need to write and you're going to take notes sort of like the greatest hits of the notes that we've gone over thus far. What are the main points that I want you to take away? Uh, what is most important to know for, for what we've done so far? At the end, when you're done with this video and you're done with your notes and you think that you've done a good job with the notes that you've taken, you're going to show them to me and then I'm going to either say go back and look at this or I'll check it off and then you can move to the next part of today. All right, so let's go ahead and begin. We're going to present. There we go. Okay, atmosphere and weather review. Each slide is going to basically be a day. Um, so you have a sheet in front of you with sections. You're writing down the keys. All right, I've sort of abbreviated everything. Write down what you need to write down. All right. So here's the purpose, I just told you that. I will take notes on what you guys, so you can't just watch it, you have to write something. All right, so the first day, we talked about the layers of the atmosphere. You need to know that there are four layers and that they're divided based on how the temperature changes. So the way I've put them, the closest layer is down here at the bottom. We live in the troposphere where temperature decreases as you increase in altitude. Now, I put little asterisks because this is important. Troposphere happens, or excuse me, weather happens in the troposphere. Above the troposphere is the stratosphere, where temperature increases as you go up. So that's how we know we've entered a different layer. As I continue to go up, oh, it's getting hotter. The stratosphere, what I really want you to know about the stratosphere is that that's where the ozone layer is and the ozone protects us from UV rays. Our third and fourth layer are the mesosphere and thermosphere where temperature decreases in the mesosphere and increases in the thermosphere, which is easy to remember because thermo means hot or heat. So goes down, goes up, goes down, goes up. It's a pattern. This is a graph that you might see. This is based on temperature and altitude. So in the troposphere, I get colder. In the stratosphere, I get warmer, colder, and warmer again as I increase. All right. The day after we talked about layers of the atmosphere, we talked about air masses. So air masses are big blobs of airs that we name based on their characteristics and they get those characteristics based on where they are formed or created. So there's four, just like there's four layers of the atmosphere, there's four types of air masses. MP means maritime polar. A maritime polar air mass is called maritime polar because it's wet and cold. It's wet and cold because it forms over oceans that are also cold. Oceans make give you the moisture, temperature determines that it's polar. MT is maritime tropical, so that's wet and warm. Forms over warm oceans. So hopefully you see that the M deals with the moisture content. So maritime means ocean. CP, continental polar, is dry and cold and will form over cold land. And CT, polar, or excuse me, continental tropical, is dry and warm and folds forms over warm land. So P stands for polar, it's cold. T stands for tropical, it's warm. So you might see a map that looks like this where these little things aren't filled in. You would be able to tell me, well, this is MP because it's over the ocean and it's really far north, so it's warm. This is CT because it's over land, so it's dry, C, and it's hot because it's closer to the equator. All right. Now, talking about air masses brought us to fronts. A front is a boundary of two air masses. That should say air, not R. Excuse me. 
So the air masses, when they meet, they don't mix together because the air are different densities. There are two main fronts I want you to know. A cold front looks like this on a weather map. There are these little blue triangles. Less dense warm air will be pushed up by cold air because cold air is more dense. And I just realized there's something down here. At a cold front, so add this, at a cold front, storms may occur, heavy rains may occur. Cloud formation happens at the front. I'll say that again. At a cold front, cloud formation occurs, and you may have heavy rain or thunderstorms. At a warm front, incoming air, warm air that is less dense, slides over this dense cold air. So you will have cloud formation not at the front, but ahead of the front. And this may bring some gentle rain. So not storms, but light rain. Warm fronts look like this on a weather map. They are little red semicircles, so you can think of them like little red sunrises. Right? So we talked about layers, we talked about air masses and how air masses, different air masses leads to fronts. We um, then looked at specifics of weather measurements. One of the things we measure is relative humidity, which is how much water is in the air compared to how much water the air can hold. So warm air holds more water. Cold air doesn't hold as much. If your relative humidity is 50%, is holding 50% of the water that it can possibly hold. It can hold more. If your relative humidity is 100%, that means the air is full of water. It is 100% full of water. No more water can be added. So we measure using a sling psychrometer, which is basically just two thermometers. One has a little cotton ball at the end that's, uh, that has water. The other one is just regular. And you sling it around and the wet bulb, the thermometer with the little cotton ball attached to it, will have a lower temperature than the dry bulb. The bigger the difference between the dry bulb and the wet bulb means it is less humid. More water was absorbed into the atmosphere because the air can hold more water. A small difference means it's more humid. And if there is no difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb, the regular thermometer, that means the air is 100% saturated and none of the water from the cotton ball could go into the air. So, here is the table that, that, looks, that we would use to uh, calculate that. You don't need to memorize this. I would give this to you if I asked a question. The most important thing is that you look at the dry bulb temperature first. So it's uh, 20 degrees Celsius. And then the difference, you're not looking at the wet bulb temperature, you're, you're subtracting. So let's say it was 20 degrees Celsius on the dry bulb and the wet bulb was 15 degrees. Well, 20 minus 15 is 5. So I'm going to keep my little, put your little finger here on 20. 20 minus 15 is 5. There's my difference. I go down and over, that means my humidity is 58%. And you can see in this table, if there's no difference, no matter what the temperature is, it's 100% humidity. The bigger the difference, the lower the humidity. All right, dew point is also related to humidity. Dew point is what your air temperature would have to cool to or drop to in order to reach 100% humidity. And it's called dew point because at 100% humidity, dew forms. So that makes sense. Just like with, um, just like with the measuring humidity, if you have a big difference between actual temperature and dew point, it is less humid. So if it's 70 degrees outside, but your dew point is in the 40s, it is really dry. You would have to cool the air down a whole lot to get 100% humidity. A small difference between actual temperature and dew point means it's more humid. It's more humid. So if it's 80 degrees and your dew point's only 70, 
It is really muggy. There's a lot of moisture in the air. I don't have to cool it down a lot to reach 100% humidity. And if your dew point is the same as your actual temperature, you are at 100% humidity. So if I look at this chart, I remember if there's no difference between the wet bulb and the dry bulb temperature, that means my dew point, that means it's 100% relative humidity, my dew point is the same as the dry bulb. All right, bigger difference will lead to a lower dew point. All right, so we talked about layers, air masses, fronts, humidity, dew point, air pressure. All right, air pressure, basically what the weight of the air is. Um, this is, this is caused, we didn't talk about this a whole lot, but I'll just say it. This is caused by differences in the heating of the earth. So with air gets heated up more, generally the air pressure is lower. Differences in air pressure across continents cause wind. And wherever you see a greater air pressure difference, your winds will be greater there. All right. So you can have either higher pressure systems or low air pressure systems. In a higher pressure system, the air weighs a lot and it's going to sink down. Now because it sinks, clouds don't form. Clouds form when air rises. So in a higher pressure system, the air sinks, there's no clouds, it's clear skies and happy, good weather. Yay, hooray for high pressure. Low air pressure is where air rises. Because it doesn't weigh as much, it is less dense, it goes up. Now when air goes up, clouds form and that can lead to storms and rain. So this snowstorm that caused us to miss all these days was caused by a low pressure system. All right, all this air rose really, really fast and made all these clouds and the air was cool enough where snow formed. And that's why we got what we got. Okay. And lastly, this is what we talked about yesterday, so we're all caught up now, are types of severe weather. There were three types I want you to know and these are sort of the highlights of them. Thunderstorms are the most common types of severe weather here and they are likely to happen at cold fronts or in low pressure systems because air is rising. You have to have air rising to make a thunderstorm. A tornado is formed when two different air masses meet, generally cold, dry air, so continental polar, meets with warm, moist air, maritime, tropical, there we go. You get a wind shear, Air is rotating. If the air rises, it takes that rotating air up, and now it's a column, and now we call it a tornado. Uh, we measure tornadoes on the fajita scale, not the fajita scale, but the fajita scale, and that is based on wind speed. Basically, the, the greater the wind speed, the higher it is on the fajita scale. So most tornadoes are like F0 to F1, so maybe winds that are between 80 miles an hour to 120 so. F5s, you're going to have winds in excess of 200 miles, maybe up to 300 miles per hour. All right. And the last one, and we did a little, a little in-class research assignment on this. Hurricanes are low-pressure systems that form over the ocean. They start as disturbances, sort of just like a loose collection of storms. They gather strength over warm water. That warm water is sort of the fuel that drives this engine. And they are pushed by these easterly winds towards, towards the North American continent when you're in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, yeah, what you should have seen in your assignment yesterday, the lower the air pressure is, the greater the wind speed is. The lower the air pressure is, the greater the wind speed. The greater the wind speed, the higher its category will be. So remember, torn or tornadoes. Hurricanes are measured on the Saffir-Simpson scale, which is based upon air pressure and wind speed. So if my air pressure goes down, the wind speed goes up, the category goes up, it's more powerful. So that concludes our greatest hits of weather and atmosphere notes. If you need to go back, please do so at this time. If you need to pause at this if you need to go back and pause, that's totally okay. If you think you are done and you have good notes, please show me and I will see that you move on to the next part of today. Thank you very much.